A century old mystery which baffled both Thomas Wedgwood and Charles Darwin could be solved this weekend. The coded inscription on the Shepherd's Monument at Shugborough Hall in Staffordshire is rumoured to reveal the location of the Holy Grail. It's puzzled experts the world over, but now a Canadian codebreaker claims to have cracked it. Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, to Shugborough Hall. And uh, my name is Richard Kemp. I'm the general manager of Staffordshire County Council that runs the hall. Um, I think it's quite fitting that we're underneath the portrait of George Anson, who, of course, was part of the family that built the place and invested the millions of pounds he won on the high seas in not just building this house, but adorning the landscape, the wider landscape, with the amazing monuments. And it's one particular monument, responsible, which was the responsibility of George and his brother Thomas, the Shepherd's Monument that has foxed um, countless generations of code crackers and uh, today we are in the company of the most recent code cracker that we've met, Louis Buff Parry, who is an internationally renowned code cracker, who is responsible for assisting the investigations of Pan Am Flight 103 and the 9-11 uh, uh, that's ongoing. So he is a, a very much respected code cracker. We're very grateful indeed that he's going to tell you for the first time uh, what he believes our Shepherd's Monument actually does say. So on January 1st, 1743, a mysterious stone tablet was retrieved from a hollowing in a naturally hewn sandstone pillar by the Leverandri scouting party, the first explorers who on that same day were the first Europeans to discover the North American Rocky Mountains. This is a map that was drawn for me by Carleton University in, in Ottawa that details the route that Leverandri the Explorer took when he found the stone tablet in the pillar. These are pillars out of thousands that I surveyed along a Milk River area. The Milk River flows into the Missouri that flows into the Mississippi in southern Alberta. This is the pillar that we're certain Leverandri retrieved the stone tablet from. Very close to this pillar, the word Preston was carved atop another pillar in Hebrew characters, the uh, pillar very close to the pillar that the stone tablet was reposed in. One just has to ask oneself, why would there be Hebrew carved atop a pillar stating Preston in North America? This is me in the middle of winter, dangling from two ropes, um, brushing aside the snow, looking at the Preston inscription. The stone that was retrieved by the Leverandries uh, was delivered to the Jesuits of Quebec in 1743. According to a set of extremely credible historical publications, including the 1787 Proceedings of the London Society of Antiquaries, the book titled Travels, published in the 1750s and written by Per Kalm for his master, Carolus Linnaeus, who was the founder of the science of botany and taxonomy, and two books published in 1802 and 1814, written by the founder of modern geography, ecology, and several other earth sciences, Baron Alexander von Humboldt. Again, this is the father of modern geography and ecology and many other earth sciences. These are not New Age grail purveyors. In 1746, French fleet captain Le Jonquier was returning some weather-damaged ships in his fleet from Quebec and Nova Scotia to France. Admiral George Anson captured part of that French fleet on record and some of its treasure, including the inscribed stone tablet. The stone was apparently then reposed by Admiral George Anson at his family's Litchfield estate and enshrined in memory by way of the Shepherd's Monument in an interlinked set of codes and ciphers. The stone is one of a set of sacred biblical stones that many secret societies knew well and Judaism as a whole also knew well that belong together. This one, seemingly identified by the inscription carved into it, is very clearly referred to in the codes and ciphers on the Shepherd's Monument. This stone of the set of two biblical stones 
is the pillow stone of Jacob, as defined in the book of Genesis. If you're not familiar with the, the biblical account of Jacob and the pillow stone, he's fallen asleep and he has a dream or not, depending on your religious orientation. And he sees the angels going up and down this ladder to heaven. And that stone becomes very important in tradition, biblical tradition, Masonic tradition. It's the so-called uh, foundation stone to the Masons. And it, it just keeps cropping up over and over. The Baroque artist Nicolas Poussin painted two depictions of the Shepherds of Arcadia, the second of which the Shepherds Monument reflects in a carved reverse image. The D and the M at the base of the Shepherds Monument in the cipher represents the 1500 verse described well in the Codes of the Relief, the 1500 verse of Genesis. The rest of the letters consist of three Hebrew words that translate to say, the bloom of Joseph. The bloom of Joseph is a reference to the apocalyptic or suffering Messiah in Hebrew called Mashiach ben Yosef, meaning the Messiah, son of Joseph. Jacob calls his son of Joseph, literally, quote, the stone and the shepherd of Israel. In verses just prior to the 1500th verse of Genesis, his first rendition clearly identifies Joseph as described in the book of Deuteronomy. And you'll see this young man here with a crown and he's pouring water in the depths. In Deuteronomy 33, uh, 13 and on, this is described. This is definitely Joseph. And the second rendition of the Shepherds of Arcadia continues the depiction of Joseph. The crown of Joseph is also carved on the outside of the casket on top of the tomb in the Shepherd's Monument. This crown and the smaller casket are in shape and legend in the Shrine of the Patriarchs of Machpelah Hebron, which is where Jacob had asked to be buried. The Babylonian Talmud, also known as the Masonic Talmud, deals extensively with this crown and Machpelah tombs, particularly Jacob's tomb on which was hung Joseph's crown. Now I'm gonna just read a quote from the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia. We know that the Ark was originally the object of the tribe of Ephraim, even before the time of Moses. Within the Ark was a sacred stone, or two sacred stones, and it then cites where you go to Genesis to find references to those stones, Genesis 28-22. Because these stones were always kept together when possible, there is every reason to believe one or both are here somewhere at Litchfield Estate. All right, no, good afternoon, please do, please. <laughs> Amazingly, a new theory from a Canadian code breaker claims this monument proves the Holy Grail is a stone buried on the grounds at Chopra. The idea that stones can be a grail or grails is not at all far-fetched. The first introduction of the concept is in reference to an artifact that is not a chalice but a stone. He believes the stone was captured by Chopra's creator, Admiral Anson, over 200 years ago, and that the monument shows it was buried here on the estate. You notice there's no, uh, there's no dot here, there's no period. I think that's a very significant thing. It's central <laughs> to the decipherment. And the reason it is, is it, it denotes or suggests the direction you read at least some of the letters in from the point of no dot, just as you read letters on that end from left to right. You'd have to read some letters from right to left. The first letter is uh, suggestive of the Hellenic Hebrew article, the, it's usually pronounced ha, but in Hellenic Hebrew, it tends toward the O sound, ho. This is Yosef. Sound it out, and that's what you hear. Yosef. And this is a Hebrew term that means bloom. So, the, the bloom of Joseph. Could you look this way, please, sir? Yes. What is significant like that? We're taught these stones are the uh, pillow stones, aren't they? Joseph and, and, and Rachel's uh, 
headstone from her grave and pillow stone from the, the, that famous incident of his falling asleep. <laughs> so within the, uh, within the sort of religion, within the faith, they're, they're hugely uh, important symbols. Wouldn't they, Extremely. Really? Where would they, if they were uncovered, where, where do you think they would be housed? There would be a lot of pressure from Israel to have certainly the pillow stone of Jacob return because it was in the first temple and there is the belief that all subsequent temples are supposed to have within them any articles that were in the first temple of Solomon. So you know there's a movement to build the third temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. So to answer your question, there would be some pressure from the state of Israel. A very likely candidate of one of those two stones surfaced in 1923 and was delivered to the archaeologist, painter, and mystic Nicholas Rorick in Paris. It, or part of it, is said to now be reposed in a Rashput casket in the cornerstone of the great building at 310 Riverside Drive in Manhattan. Albert Einstein paid tribute to the laying of this cornerstone in 1929, along with every other world leader of note, every great artist, every great scientist, Max Planck included, um, all fussing over this matter of this stone. I also have here the, the diagrams, drawings, and photographs of that same shape that repeats itself from the casket that's added to this reverse relief that is not in Nicholas Poussin's original paintings, but is carved on the reverse relief on a shepherd's monument, that is the same shape as the casket that the stone is delivered in, that is the same shape as the tombs in Machpelah. I was sent initially in 1985-86 by the head of the Rosicrucian order to visit the Rorick Museum in New York and to visit Daniel Enten, the director of the Rorick Museum. At that time, I knew nothing about plots to murder, collective murder that would come. And I hadn't yet met Jean-Luc Chaumay. That was after my first meeting with the director of the Rorick Museum. We're looking at uh, a painting by Svetislav Rorick, uh, the son of uh, Nicholas and Helena Rorick. He composed this after, after 1923. Uh, it is the Rothenberg casket that carried uh, the stone to Nicholas and Helena Rorick at Saint Place Vendôme in Paris, Five uh, Vendôme Place uh, in Paris, and it itself was uh, was in a pine wood box that bore the title Bankers Trust, and then quite mysteriously delivered to Nicholas and Helena Rorick. I I had the honor to uh, sit with uh, Sviatoslav, the, the, the painter of this painting, in Bangalore, India, where I learned from him that the ingredients of this particular uh, Rothenberg casket ended up in another casket and placed in the cornerstone of a magnificent building, the master building built in 1929 for Nicholas Rorick and his studios and his art schools and the incredible contribution that he was at that time making to humanity. The casket itself is associated um, in antiquity with, uh, with uh, Saint Uta, uh, who's uh, commemorated in statuary in Rothenburg and she's holding the casket. And this goes back almost a thousand years, this depiction of St. Uta in Rothenburg, Germany. And there's a, a connection there that's extremely interesting that has to do with, with some additional 
ingredients, uh, old leather, worn leather pieces that were used to uh, cover the stone that are said to have been actually uh, uh, originated with uh, King Solomon and passed along the line ultimately through uh, Rabbi Moses ben Maimonides. You might notice the, that there are four M's painted on the outside. They're quite mysterious. Uh, no one's sure precisely what the M's stand for. There's, there's a lot of speculation about it. They can have to do with Master Masonry, Master Mason, uh, Master Moriah, uh, all kinds of different possibilities. But what is known is that the M has been used as a code letter through the arcane societies of Europe uh, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, denoting something that the initiate eventually is able to understand. So that when that M manifests again in iconography, in statuary or otherwise, in literature, that initiate then is able to follow the code. This tells us, to at least to some extent, that the whole transmission and conveyance of the object within it is part of uh, the transmission and conveyance of the so-called secrets of, of many arcane societies through European and Asian and North American history. We have a series of events with the Jesuits associated with the Rorix. When the Rorix received the stone tablet, there is an immediate flurry of entries in Helena Rorick's diary about Jesuits trying to monitor the stone, trying to gain control of it. Clearly, Helena Rorick was aware that the Jesuits had control of it at one time earlier in history, and in fact, she wrote about that. So we've got, in 1923, Helena reporting that the Jesuits were looking uh, to monitor the stone. And in 1924, the, the next year, she enters into her log that the Jesuits tried to capture the stone. She even names one of the Jesuits and not only tried to capture the stone or steal it from her, but tried to kill her in relation to her possession of the artifact. Fast track a little bit here again to February 1975. We have Frank Horsch found murdered in the basement of Rorick's master building, the 29-story building that Frank Horsch's father Lewis had built for Rorick. And his murder is extremely interesting. The question is, is there a relationship between between those two events, the event of the Cornerstone and the murder of Frank Horsch? The Cornerstone is the southwest corner, which is over here. We're in the boiler room. This is where the murder of Frank Horsch occurred um, in proximity to these two, these two boilers. Um, so, it, so we are literally in the same South southern half of the building. The fact that there was an attempted break-in to the cornerstone to retrieve the casket that was set into it in 1929 is interesting, but perhaps most telling is the reports that we get from people who live in the building and reports associated with the Rorick Museum. The fact that there was a Jesuit who was working in the master building at the time that Frank Horsch was murdered and this particular Jesuit replaces him as the building manager. This Jesuit had an undue interest in the history of this stone. He spent a lot of time attending to matters concerning the cornerstone of the building in which is either a, a complete stone tablet or a shard of it why would they want to retrieve it? What's the point? And that's really the remaining part of this uh, investigation to figure out what it is that would make people like the very brilliant Jesuits who are associated with spawning the Illuminati uh, back in the late 18th century. You know, what is it that they would uh, find so compelling and intriguing about it that, that would empower them? Give us some directions here. What are oh, well, the of course, the George. Oh, this is north. Okay. And we're looking north uh, uh, east. So we have uh, just taking a look. Yeah, well, St. John, 
The divine is right over there. You can see the scaffold. Right in the middle. Yeah, right. With the spires coming yes, up. Yes, right, exactly. And then the, the, uh, the southern well, name, what do they call it? The dome, the dome. Yeah. I did a photo, I, I, I painted Bishop Paul Moore uh, walking into the uh, St. John the Divine Cathedral on the day that St. Francis is celebrated and they bless all the animals oh, yes. over oh, there. Yes. Oh, and yes. he bought several paintings from me yeah. and they're, they're with the family estate now. What I'm getting at here is yeah. the this association of this stone with atomic energy. Yeah. Nicholas did the same thing. He said you had to put it between two lithium plates when you were storing it. This is a very That's wild, dead. far out thing. Yeah. But then, then you get this kind of an entry. Yeah. Jesuit Conrad Rudendorf. Right. And his formula for atomic energy, Helena's warning on page 112 of the Threshold of the New yeah. World. Yeah. About this Jesuit. She also talks about all the different times the Jesuits received the stone. Right. Well, the one that was found from here, yeah. 1743, it went right to the Jesuits in, in New France, in Quebec. We have oh. their names. So the Jesuits are, are in this yes, all the, the way, beginning. and it's, oh, and it's frighteningly uh, peculiar when you start yeah. really getting into it. 1928, Einstein sends his tidings for the laying of the cornerstone here. Yeah. Um, the same year he issued his paper on gravity uh -huh. and electromagnetism. Uh -huh. It's there's there's That's a sequence and then look at how look at how strange this is. This is about Wallace and and his letter to Rorick talking about the stone coming the stone of yeah. destiny coming to America. Rorick calls this uh -huh. stone in effect the Grail Stone. Because Parsifal named it Lepis Exilis, and that's exactly the name Rorik gives it, in addition to Chintamani, which means Stone of Wisdom, and so forth. So it's, it's, I'm not saying I believe all these things. All I'm saying is this is from so many different vantages. These are the, the data that, that uh, one can accumulate around this artifact, and it just, it's just very, very bizarre. Yeah, here. I see there. there's a whole thing about the dollar bill, I see. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, yeah and that's we're, very we're, interesting. <laughs> here's the, of course, you know, it, it, I, I, you know, you're giving me a whole... <laughs> that's the painting upstairs in the Rorick Museum of the same casket. Huh. That's Rorick holding it. Oh, gosh. Oh, that's a great picture, isn't it? I, I love those two. They're just, they just—they seem so innocent, don't they? But something tells me that he, he's just—you know—just yeah. by oh, going God. through this. This is wonderful. Okay, and then oh, of course you know these, I know all this. these, yes. and this one. I, uh, all, that. I, all I can say is I, I'm going to go back now and look at everything much more carefully. Oh, yeah. there's something enormous in addition to everything you already know that's behind all of it, and huh. you, you, you'll see. I'm going to give you a couple clues to it here. This is Helena Rorick calling the stones the teraphim. Yeah. And in Hebrew, you know, you know, tarif means either comforter or nourisher. Teraphim are the comforters or nourishers that become associated with idols that Rachel mm -hmm. stole from Laban. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, it's a, it, the story is extremely interesting. What, what, what this word tarif, teraphim, has to do with the so-called comforter that runs through all of these religions' histories, mm -hmm. and and why she would call the stones that by that title it becomes extremely explosively interesting. It's a published diary. That was ten thirty twenty eight. Yeah, and what she's stating here uh, tonight, we put the last coin in the casket. We wrapped it in silk um, and sealed it with Nicholas Rorick's ring. We lined the interior of the casket with silk, then locked it. E.I. took the key. I'm not sure who E.I. is. Right. Uh, uh, sealed with Rorick's ring. So here are the items that have been placed in the casket. A portrait of M.M. That can mean Master Mor Moria, Moriah, uh, but 
there's a lot of question about yeah. who M.M. is. Um, his letter, Nicholas's, or message. And then Aida writes on the side, Cena omits a piece of the stone that was placed in, it's either his or this casket. And the letter goes on. All these were covered with blue silk and sealed on October 30, 1928 in Darjeeling. The Great Seal of the United States features a truncated pyramid with the all-seeing eye enclosed within a sunburst. This symbol of illumination alludes to the nature of the casket and stone sought by FDR, which was received by Rorich in the 1920s. It was Rorich's influence and suggestion that this symbol be placed on the dollar bill. Here we have Nicholas Rorick's painting, titled Treasure of the World. It's also called Chintamani, sometimes translated from Sanskrit to mean stone of wisdom or stone of joy. The stone, once again, is in the Rothenberg casket here. The painting was completed in 1924, only within months of having received this Rothenberg casket containing the stone. What's interesting about the whole layout in this painting is the juxtaposing of that collection of motifs with these columnar pillars that would uh, presumably be sandstone pillars. That he anthropomorphizes them with these human heads is very interesting because where Lavarandri found the famous what's sometimes now called Stone of Destiny, when he was exploring the central and western parts of North America and was the first European to discover the Rocky Mountains, he retrieved an inscribed stone tablet that was set inside of a hollowing of a pillar that looks much like these pillars that Rorick has depicted. But it suggests that Rorick seemed to know something about the account of Lavarandri finding or retrieving the stone tablet in 1743. Either parallel accounts and sagas about a sacred artifact or about two separate sacred artifacts that for some reason end up with the same events occurring around each. The second painting has a depiction of the same Rothenberg casket this painting is called Burning of Darkness. It depicts several people, including the Rorick family, emerging from a cave with a master bearing the glowing Rothenberg casket inside of which is, of course, the stone tablet. But these sum up the importance that the Roricks assigned to the meaning, the history, the value of this artifact that was delivered to them in 1923 at 5 Place Vendôme in Paris. We're at Place Vendôme. to the Sultan of Brunei. Other things started to crop up. By the time I visited Jean-Luc, um, I learned from Jean-Luc in Paris that the authors of Holy Blood, Holy Grail had been to Paris and met with Henry Lincoln, and there was an interesting luncheon between Steven Spielberg and the three authors of Holy Blood, Holy Grail that had to do with the use of some of the information in the book, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, for Steven Spielberg's third Indiana Jones film. 
and Jean-Luc Chaumay had provided much of that information and felt left out and was upset and actually was considering taking court action for the use of his information and in, in intellectual property in the third Indiana Jones movie. What came of that was I was asked by Jean-Luc to deliver to Steven Spielberg the books that Jean-Luc had written in which could be found the original publication of information that had been turned over to Steven Spielberg by Béjant Leek and, and Lee in Paris. And I did that and we have an interesting paper trail concerning the relationship between uh, Jean-Luc, uh, the authors of Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and Steven Spielberg. The criticism of those who have added to Église Saint-Sulpice, so much of the current obscure and arcane history, is not to suggest that there is not a mystical and arcane side to this Église Saint-Sulpice. There is. It is in the very founder, Saint-Sulpice. He himself was a great mystic, and when you examine his history, there is a lot of association with him and with what he did by the same societies that are associated with more popular books such as Holy Blood, Holy Grail. This notice has been put up in the last two years and what it addresses is the misconceptions that have resulted in Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. The meridian line materialized by a brass inlay in the pavement of this church is part of a scientific instrument built here during the 18th century. This was done in full agreement with church authorities by the astronomers in charge of the newly established Paris Observatory. They used it for defining various parameters of the Earth's orbit for the enactment of the calendar. What this does is describe how the light shines through the window at certain times of the year uh, to, to uh, give you an indication of the solstice and the equinox. In, again, the Da Vinci Code, the rose line is equated with the term Rosalind. And here is where some of the most grievous errors are made in misleading comments that have a lot of people believing a, a, a lot of fanciful nonsense. Roslin is a Gaelic term that means waterfall. Rosklin literally combined means waterfall. So Roseline, um, even here it was never called, much less in, in, in Scotland where Roslin Chapel is. Roslin and Roseline have nothing to do with each other. Etymologically and linguistically, they bear no linkage whatsoever. But the fact is, it was never called the rose line here either. Please also note that the letters P and S in the small round windows at both ends of the transept refer to Peter and Sulpice, the patron saints of the church, not an imaginary priory of Zion. And priory of Zion is imaginary and has been for several centuries. And French courts have decided that in the 1990s by the evidence given and have declared the last Grand Master to be a hoax and a fraud. We are now in the sacristy that was built under the direction of the Count of Maurepas, uh, King Louis XV's Secretary of State and Secretary of the Marine. This is a very interesting uh, sacristy in that it was not the sacristy that was initially built for Eglise Saint Sulpice and it was used for other purposes. This is where it's thought secret orders and societies had their meetings. You'll see the kind of anomalous five-pointed star on the roof or the ceiling. Over to the left you will see the arched section of the Moripa sacristy. At one time, it contained writings by Moripa, behind the panels. The writings are no longer there, and the wooden panels have been added since the time of Moripa. It is said by the Sulpician priests that what was there had to do with the secret meetings that occurred between Moripa, Radcliffe, 
Voltaire and others of their thinking. The fact is, the Count of Maurepas, Frederick Filippo, was a revolutionary himself, and that he wanted the restoration of the Stuart dynasty in Britain, England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales. He did all he could to bring this about through the Bonnie Prince Charlie, the young pretender, who was in the Église Saint-Sulpice with Maurepas, Voltaire, Charles Radcliffe, who brought much of Freemasonry to France. This section was scratched out by the revolutionaries several decades after King Louis XV paid his homage to Le Comte de Maurepas et de Pontchartrain. The idea that, that the Count of Maurepas should just be thrown in with the king and others who were the subject of the, of the effacement by the revolutionaries is really not fair because the Count of Maurepas was probably as revolutionary as the revolutionaries were. They, he was just more inclined toward the monarchy he wished to have, which would have been ruled by the House of Stuart in Great Britain as well as in France. The Count of Maurepas and of Pontchartrain, also titled the Secretary of State and Secretary of the Marine, who was the Marguillier or the warden of Église Saint-Sulpice, is reported to have received in either 1743 or 1746 an inscribed stone tablet. The, the people who reported uh, his reception of this artifact include founders of great sciences like Alexander von Humboldt, who's the modern father of of uh, geography and who founded ecology and volcanology and so forth. Carolus Aeneas was, after all, the, the founder of botany and taxonomy. He sent his favorite student over to North America and that student, Percom, interviewed this explorer, La Verandry, who is said to have retrieved that same artifact and shipped the artifact to Paris in, again, 1743 or 1746. It is all too convenient and obviously not a coincidence that that stone tablet that the, that the Count of Maurepas is said to have received in all of these wonderful books like Views of Nature, Percom's Travels and others, is the model upon which the stone tablet that was buried right beneath our feet here um, in relation to the so-called Rose Line in the Da Vinci Code. The stone tablet is called later a keystone in the Da Vinci Code, but the original stone tablet that the Count of Maurepas received it has nothing to do with the stone tablet that Dan, that Dan Brown refers to, but Dan Brown ob obtained the information from someone and we can trace the handlers of this data uh, from 1986 through to Dan Brown finally writing the book. He, of course, credits no one uh, for having provided the information about a real genuine artifact that is associated with the Count of Maurepas and that um, does bear an inscription and that appears to be a sacred inscription. Jean-Luc, uh, interestingly, in the, in the next decade, um, ended up uh, hired by the French judicial police to investigate uh, the Solar Temple murders, uh, which had then been called suicides, while at the same time he was in a, a vicious court uh, dispute with the purported Grand Master of the Priory of Zion, Pierre Plantard. An RCMP spokesman confirmed today that there is an ongoing investigation into money laundering by the Solar Temple cult. 
53 cult members died in Quebec and Switzerland last week. Some may have committed suicide, but police think many were murdered. Radio-Canada has reported the cult was a front used to cover up money laundering and arms smuggling. In Quebec, police are uncovering more and more details about the deaths there, and as the CBC's Jed Kahane reports, the more they find, the more gruesome the case becomes. The investigation into the Solar Temple uh, deaths resulted in Jean-Luc concluding that they were murders. He filed that report with the, with the judicial police and with the, with the judge himself who was overseeing the investigation. Many of the, if not most, of the Solar Temple members were members of the Rosicrucian order and also members of the Rorick Society in Switzerland. Um, but it's very, very much coincidental and paralleling the events associated with my investigation and, you know, the fact that it was the director of the, of the Rosicrucian Order that had sent me to the head of the Rorick Museum and Center in New York, or that was followed later by these murders, is interesting. Jean-Luc's conclusion in his reports to the French uh, judicial police was that they were murdered because they, they knew things that uh, 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 they weren't supposed to know. Here we sit tonight at the very table where Melina Lacori sat 20 years ago, almost to the night, in La Mediterranean. Paris. I was with the Governor General's assistant, Jeanine Trubé, and we discussed together the idea of a script that Steven Spielberg might want to consider uh, that would deal with the, uh, the true original location of Arcadia, which was Greece, and of course at that time Melina McCory was no longer playing a prostitute and never on Sunday, but was the Minister of Culture of Greece. <laughs> and uh, we mused over that difference, um, and she was very excited about it. The other interesting aspect of our being here tonight, uh, sort of commemorating the event, is that the, this was Jean Cocteau's favorite restaurant in Paris, and to the extent that he was recognized and favored as a client, uh, they have uh, one of Jean Cocteau's famous uh, sketches, tattooed on their on their plates, so to speak. It's on their menus, and uh, shortly we will go and visit uh, some of Jean Cocteau's uh, sketches that are hanging on the wall in the other chambre. And, and the, the big question is, did Coc what did Cocteau know about all of these things, and was he, was he really and truly part, you know, uh, front and center of, of that tradition that Rorick is associated with? around 1918, 1919, they were traveling together through Paris, uh, working on, on, uh, on collective art projects with Stravinsky, Rites of Spring, um, some of the major events that were, that were occurring in the city. So they're, they're quite close, and there was a time when I actually thought that it was, uh, that it was Jean Cocteau who had delivered the stone tablet to Rorick, that he, he was the person who had taken this artifact of the priori the Sion to uh, Rorick to be the next consecutive custodian of you know the of the object but I was convinced because he was at that time the Grand Master of this what now is considered to be a bogus priori of Sion in the French courts in the 1990s uh, through Jean-Luc Chaumet's uh, court cases with uh, Pierre Plantard. Here is uh, Melina McCoury's signature that she left the night that we all had supper together 20 years ago, and, and they've, they've kept it on the wall ever since. Here is one of Jean Cocteau's uh, sketches, uh, completed in 1930, that he gave to uh, the Mediterranean, um, even though it opened in the 1940s. It was a gift from Jean Cocteau to the restaurant. One more uh, around the corner. This is uh, this was completed uh, the 10th of February, 1955. Jean Cocteau's name is at the top. It was one of his works in pastels, one of his uh, few works in pastels. And that too hangs in uh, 
the Mediterranean. in front of the famous painting by Poussin uh, with two different titles. One of the titles, as it states on the placard, is Les Bergers d'Arcadie and also Et in Arcadia Ego. Uh, looking at the, at the painting, we have several codes that have not been properly identified. One is the crag that uh, is said to be in southern France, close to Montsegur and uh, rennes le chateau uh, I was beneath that crag in the actual land that was first titled Arcadia in Peloponnesus, uh, southwestern Greece, in 1982. And I can tell you with certainty that this crag is the same crag from the actual original Arcadia. The four shepherds are the holy family of Jacob who is looking at and pointing to the inscription on the tomb that says et in Arcadia ego. Rachel, his wife, is standing with her right hand on the back of one of her two sons. They both are without beards. Jacob here has the beard. It is thought that uh, the tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin, was uh, exiled to Arcadia uh, back during the period when, when the Benjamites had a falling out with the rest of, uh, of the tribes of Israel after the return from Egypt. I'm the first to understand the code of Rachel, Jacob, Benjamin, and Joseph, as opposed to any uh, number of other identities that have been assigned to to this painting. And I think that uh, Nicolas Poussin has thrown together the whole family in this case and loaded the painting with a lot of other indicators and codes, most of which have not been properly uh, identified or addressed and instead have been misconstrued by this uh, recent event in popular culture uh, linking this painting to the so-called Priory of Zion, the dossier secret that were filed in the uh, National Library of France in the 1960s that call attention to the shepherdess of this painting for reasons obscure and for reasons very interesting because the rest of the documents are apparently forgeries. But I, I would hold that, that that one indicator in the dossier secret suggests that, so, that those forgers were in touch with something that was not requiring forgery. Here we have Nicolas Poussin's uh, painting of the infant Moses stepping on the crown of the Pharaoh. This is very important because this account is given only by way of Flavius Josephus who lived just at the end of the time of Jesus and afterward, after and wrote as a Jewish historian and traveler accounts that he had picked up from the Holy Land. And the account ends up in the Talmud. The point is that, that Nicholas Poussin had actually accessed Flavius Josephus's recording of the event through Athanasius Kircher, the famous mystic scientist and code breaker amongst the Jesuits, who was Nicolas Poussin's teacher for a period in Rome, before Nicolas Poussin had become the teacher of Claude Lorraine. The, the role of Athanasius Kircher is, is absolutely central to all of this business about codes that Nicolas Poussin is supposed to have been a transmitter of, because we do know that Athanasius Kircher was a code breaker, a code transmitter, possessed the Voynich manuscript that is written in a cipher um, and that was supposed to have been in the hands of the Cathars a few centuries before. Here we have the self-portrait of Nicolas Poussin and there are several features in this self-portrait worth taking note of. Uh, one is the use of that color that he 
himself suggested was uh, employed for code purposes, and it seems to be the back of the chair that Nicholas is sitting on. Also in this painting is, is the use of that same sort of crimsony persimmon color in the ribbon that's tying the scroll together. But if you look carefully at his right hand, it appears he's wearing either a star sapphire or a, a well-faceted black onyx in a setting that is reflecting light in a manner that it shouldn't if, if it's a clean facet. And it, would, and it would have to be a clean, flat facet to, if it's an actual gem. The V that is described so perfectly here may be an indication that, that the celebration of the meaning of the feminine, particularly in this painting, is, that is symbolized here. Because if you look behind uh, Nicholas, you see a woman with someone putting his arms or her arms on each of her shoulders in a gesture of friendship. What would that be there for in a self-portrait if he wasn't juxtaposing the feminine, literally, with the feminine symbolically. But look again over here at the all-seeing eye on her crown. That's a very peculiar addition symbolically, you know, from the 17th century of the all-seeing eye that we know ends up on the dollar bill and used in Freemasonry and other arcane and secret societies for the purposes that uh, are pretty well known by this time. Well, I know that many brave knights dwell with the Grail. Always when they ride out, it is to seek adventure. They do so, these Templars, Will their reward be victory or defeat? A valiant host lives there, a stone of the purest kind. If you do not know it, it shall here be named for you. It is called Lapis Exilis. The stone is called the Grail. From Parzival, Wolfram van Eschenbach. contemporary uh, treatments of the subject, we can find references to events that happened in the 6th century uh, BC. And this is when the prophet Jeremiah is leaving the Holy Land with a young lady named Princess Tephi, who is the daughter of King Zedekiah. They arrive in Ireland, and from Ireland they move through Iona into Scotland. Jeremiah brought with them some remarkable things, including an ark and a wonderful stone called Leophael, which turns out to be that famous stone of destiny in its first form, which is the pillow stone of Jacob. The other references to the stone in this context of Jeremiah includes the historical account of what the earliest Scots did when Kenneth Macklepin in the 9th century AD creates a, a literally United Kingdom of the Scots and the Picts using this stone as, if you will, a talisman in battle from the 9th century on. The reliquary shrine of Columba, the Brekanach, was a small casket carried on the breast supported by a strap fixed to clasps at each end. For the next 500 years, each new king of Scotland came to the hill of Scone to be raised on the stone. And that goes to the later use by the Jacobites, most of whom were Scots when they were fighting in, in Britain, using the stone once again in battle as a talisman uh, for victory and by which to reinstate the Stuart dynasty through King James II's descendants. So we've got three interesting incidents of the use of these sacred stones in battle, but uh, without even that connected, there's this consistency of this casket 
associated with the stone in at least five or six different instances. The Stone of Destiny, it was uh, deputed that, that uh, all the kings of Scotland and queens of Scotland uh, going way back in time uh, were crowned upon it. You had to sit on, on the stone to, uh, to be made the crown. This is why they call it the Stone of Destiny. And it was reputed to be uh, Jacob's pillow. But uh, the, the, this, this, you don't know what, what the truth of the thing is because people didn't, didn't, they didn't have recording machines, etc. <laughs> <They're laughs> back in those days. <laughs> Aye. And how Jacob could put his head on a uh, well, pillow uh, that big it, is it, a it, wonder it, to me. Unlike others who go to Roslyn Chapel to find the Holy Grail inside pillars and the rest of it, I've had uh, cooperation with the Roslyn Chapel officials, the Chapel Trust Director, Stuart Beatty, and uh, one of the leading masons of the area and experts on Roslyn Chapel who goes around the world to Masonic lodges giving lectures on the subject. And he believes that this is where the stone was kept. In 1715, the Jacobites took this stone from Roslyn Chapel niche and marched behind it to Preston, where their campaign was temporarily quashed. We're here in uh, the town square of Preston, northern central England, where the Jacobites in the first major uprising met their so-called maker. This is a describer that uh, gives you some history of what happened. This is the location where Standish's and Anson's were apprehended as part of the Jacobite rebellion. From here, they were exiled to New England in 1716. This is how the word Preston ended up carved close to the repose of the stone tablet in North America. It's great that they, they managed to, to, to do something with the, the, the waste heaps or the, or the, or the, or the coal miners. Beautiful the way the landscape to the world. And this idea of the pyramid, well, why not? So we're standing on coal slag. Well, it's coal slag, right? What a way to answer the mystery of the pyramids in Egypt. That's right. <laughs> Come to Scotland and build it on coal slag. <laughs> Do you think that much was really altered inside in terms of carvings and, and... Well, it's hard to say because um, in the building trade they have a saying that the last man frees all. The last man's usually the painter and he can paint over all the mistakes, yes. you see? So yeah, what yeah. happened in Roslyn in 1955, it was decided that it would scrub the whole of the inside of the chapel down with wire brushes and then they painted it with a, a cement slurry. So that's why it all looks, it looks the same now. So that would hide a whole host of uh, changes in what had taken place. You've seen a lot of the, the, the real, you know, yeah. earnest uh, interest and then a lot of the yeah. flack and the oh, nonsense. Yes, the nonsense. But people come in there with, with you know, expectations. The amount of times that I've been asked for, where is the Holy Grail? Yes. You know? Well, there was an attempt to, to uh, crack open the, the uh, oh, apprentice I, pillar, wasn't there? Oh, I, well, 
that happened to me actually. I was doing a repair of oh, maybe about 20, 30 years ago. And beside the, the apprentice part, and this guy came in and uh, workman's overalls on, and he's carrying a, a tool bag. And he said, Is that the apprentice puller? I says, Aye. So I'll demonstrate what he did. He put the bag down, took out a chisel this length, and a five pound mash hammer, and he, he, up to the, 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 the puller like this. But this time I'm on my feet and I confronted him and I says, What are you going to do? He says, I'm going to find the Holy Grail. And they always whisper, Anything to do with this Holy Grail? Oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I had, to, I had to take a grip of him and just put my arms round about and carry him screaming and kicking outside the door. Oh, here it is, the name pressed with Priest's Town. Okay, that's it. At the top of this pillar is a, an interesting slab that is being held by what would appear to be angels. It is a heart-shaped stone slab uh, carved within the chapel as the pillar was uh, being constructed that is said to be the possible repose of the true stone of destiny. The true stone of destiny is said to be Jacob's pillow stone. And that would be about the right size, the, the, the right proportions, dimensions, the right uh, kind of uh, repose to contain, a, a, in a camouflage way, the much smaller pillow stone of Jacob. The Earl of Roslyn, Sir Peter Erskine, made a distinction in one of his publications between the Stone of Destiny and the True Stone of Destiny, suggesting, he did, uh, that the True Stone of Destiny was reposed in uh, Rosalind Chapel. I am of that same opinion that the smaller Bethel Grail Pillow Stone of Jacob was reposed here. The whole of Rosalind's story is filled with intrigue and enigma. We've for instance, have carvings of plants that were, were not discovered until 100 years after they were carved here. Now, that's an, an interesting enigma. We know the Knight Templars were in Westford, Massachusetts, and they overwintered with the Mi'kmaq Indians. I, I think that's very well recognized and accepted. Compounding the mystery, or perhaps revealing some of the mystery, uh, is the fact that the city I come from, Edmonton, has a district named Roslyn, spelled R-O-S-S-L-Y-N, not R-O-S-L-I-N, and in the city archives uh, one finds that the source of the, the name of this district is the very chapel, uh, Roslyn Chapel. I think I've discovered the source of the naming, and I believe that it is the, uh, the Earl of South Ask, James Carnegie, mm -hmm. and the historians now in, in Alberta and in Edmonton, particularly at the University, are tending to agree with me that he's the most likely candidate to have named R that district uh, Roslyn after Roslyn Chapel. Yes, I mean, I, I, I'm aware of this and we've had communications with, with Edmonton on this subject and I think it's, I think it's very exciting. May uh, I give you a, a brief story then that, that goes along with that? That um, when the botanist was looking at the plants that we identified, and we were looking primarily at yellow cactus, sweet corn, those images, and he said that he would not hand on heart say that they were identical sufficiently um, to, to guarantee they'd come from the new world. They were similar, but bear in mind these are professional academics and so therefore if it's not 100% they're not comfortable. And um, he was explaining that perhaps you know, the people who had seen the plants in the new world drew them on parchment, who knows what, uh, took the image the image was then translated to wood, it would have been translated to stone subsequently. Three or four different hands dealing with the same image. And by the time it's translated to the stonework that we have in the chapel, it's three or four removed from the original and therefore it may have some discrepancies. 
and and he was he was quite comfortable with that um, until he saw the trefoil and the trefoil he said no oh, no no this persuades me because this would not have been found anywhere else and so if you've got the trefoil I'm far more persuaded that you've got the other genuine plants rather than sort of close lookalikes so the trefoil was was pretty fundamental to his thinking okay. The natural original growth location for, it's called Trifolium variegatum, oh. is in the flood meadows of the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains. Yeah. It's spread from there spread from by there. people carrying Cut it. In it yeah. But it's supposed to be to native people in medicine, and they would dry it, yes. and they traded it. Yeah. Yeah. That accounts for why, if Prince Henry Sinclair reached Nova Scotia, he might have been given it by indigenous peoples. You know, the, the, the only thing, evidence, hard evidence that you can go by is, is, is the carvings. And then, uh, it's, and some of the other carvings, there's your other carving, the one that you were on about. Yes. You can see the concave on it. Yeah. <laughs> to my eyes, it looks as if it, it's been locked a wee bit. Yes. You know, it's been cropped down, perhaps. That it might have one time held something of that shape. Yeah, there's no other stone mentioned in, 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 in biblical terms uh, that, that's concave. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jacob's pillow was concave because it had to be in the shape of his head. Exactly. But they call them the betel stones. One is Rachel's headstone and the yeah. other is Jacob's pillow stone. That it arrived here, you know, there's that account that it came by way of Iona. Well. And, and then there's another possibility. You know, the Cathars were uh, yes. very much associated with the, the comforter issue because yes. they were Manichaeans and yeah. Manny yeah. called himself yeah. the comforter. Yeah. It seems to me that if there's a code and if there's a lot yeah, of right. hidden secrecy going on, it has as much to do with this yeah. than anything else. Yeah.
first visit to uh, uh, Litchfield Estate, Shugborough Hall, resulted in uh, my being pulled into the back of a, of a black van and, and uh, literally tortured to the point where my nail was popped out by a very interesting device I have never seen before. And, and photos were also taken of, uh, of injuries that I suffered to the upper part of my, my chest, around especially my breast here on the left. answers that, that, that were satisfactory to the individuals that had yanked me into the back of the van. I went straight away to deliver to my 20-page report and other information about my decipherment, and that was back in the latter part of 2004. Has come from Canada to film a documentary. Um, he's a very, very important code breaker and does it professionally. Helped uh, solve the Pan Am Flight 103 uh, outrage as well as helping out with the 9 11 investigations. talking about um, an amateur, We're talking about a professional. And it struck us that the Shepherd's Monument was an amazing way of getting into mid 18th century minds. Because there was a, an encoded message, um, it was obviously designed to say something to somebody. Um, and if we could crack it and work out what was being said, then it might be a way of getting behind the scenes, in a sense, getting inside people's heads from the past. So uh, back in um, nearly two years ago, we put out a challenge to the world, really, to say, can you work out what this um, inscription and this coded monument actually means? Um, and out popped all sorts of interesting people, including um, Louis. Um, and. You know, you get a flood of, of different explanations. It's very difficult to know what to uh, what to believe, what not to believe. We're not experts ourselves, um, but it, it soon became clear from reading Louis's work that he had explained everything in a way that other people had left things hanging. He's looked at all aspects, not just the the letters and not just the imagery, but the the, the combination. Um, he's explained things like the missing dot behind the final V. Um, as I said, there are lots of things that you want to get into deeper, deeper level with, but it's a complete, it's a me an enmeshed explanation which holds water whichever way you look at it, from whichever direction you look at it. I'm Andrew Baker. I'm a composer and I'm a librarian. I've been involved with Chabra and the Priory of Science story Ooh, for 30 years. I met Henry Lincoln, Michael Bajant and Richard Lee in 1980 when they were working on the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail. And a couple of years after that, I moved to live in an old cottage just down the road from Shubra, an old estate cottage. And Michael Bajant passed me a lot of their research material so I could find possible connections between the Priory of Zion Grandmasters and what was happening at Shubra. Hardly anyone had done any research at that point about the Shepherd's Monument and the people behind it. And I've uncovered an enormous amount about the fascinating ideas of Thomas Wright, the architect, connections of Thomas Hanson with various groups, people like Francis Dashwood of the Hellfire Club. And it persuaded me that there was something very mysterious and strange at Shabra. It was probably ten years after that that I finally discovered, through going back to original sources, how much of the story of the Priory of Zion is absolute rubbish and proving very easily that so much is built on very amateurish hoax documents about the mystery of Rennes-le-Chateau 
and finding out what a dubious character Pierre Planta was with his background, and his friend for Philippe Cherise, who turns out to be a comedian and surrealist writer, I realised that that whole prior design thing is a load of absolute drivel, but I was left with an enormous amount of genuine, fascinating material, which is about similar curious ideas at Chabra. This is the famous Shepherd's Monument of Litchfield Estate Shugborough Hall. In the school of art that Nicholas Poussin uh, attended in Rome, there was a teacher named Athanasius Kircher who was a very mysterious Jesuit and an early Jesuit at that. Nicholas Poussin was selected in Paris by the Jesuits who were in Paris at the time because of his depiction of the founder of the Jesuit or order, Ignatius Loyola. It must be remembered that Ignatius Loyola was beatified and canonized because of the secret that God informed him of about the nature of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is called the Comforter in the book of John after the Comforter is identified as one yet to come after Jesus. So this would be Jacob, this would be Benjamin, this would be Joseph, and this would be Rachel. That school in Rome that was taught by Athanasius Kircher was also attended by uh, Poussin's younger colleague named Claude Lorraine. Claude Lorraine painted and sketched Rachel no less than nine times by name. It's very clear that this woman is the biblical Rachel. Claude Lorraine paints her by name, sketches her by name, in similar attire with buildings that are Roman and Greek in the backdrop. It was the common feature of Baroque painting and, and also uh, late Renaissance painting to, to do this, to use Greco-Roman period uh, motifs for biblical settings in the round church of Temple Church in the temple section of London. You're going to find the sarcophagi all over the floor of Knights Templar. Their heads are on pillow stones. This is a precise depiction of what a pillow stone is. The small pillow stone that Jacob was told to stand up and anoint is symbolic of a Messiah. The act of pouring of anointing a stone or a human is Meshiach. It means anointed or to anoint. For the code to be stating bloom of Joseph, it is suggestive of both the tradition of the Meshiach ben Yosef and hearkening back to the original stone that was symbolically, prophetically an indication of this coming Messiah. His lineage that produces a a Messiah is associated with the term Meshiach ben Yosef, the, the Messiah of the son of Joseph. There's also Meshiach ben Yehuda, who is the Messiah of the son of Judah, her full-blooded sister's son. Now this is the Messiah in Jewish tradition who is associated with the apocalypse and suffering, exactly what Jesus went through. The main indication of, of the arrival of that Messiah would be and would have been the destruction of the temple. Jesus himself said, in this generation, this temple will be destroyed, the temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and sure enough, it was after Jesus' passing. So that would make Jesus the apocalyptic and suffering Messiah, and Christians don't have much problem with that. The problem arises in identifying the matriarch who spawns this Messiah, and it is Rachel, not her sister Leah. 
which puts into question why it is that we end up believing that Jesus is the Messiah from the house of David and the tribe of Judah. But the secret tradition of the Comforter moves along from Rachel all the way through the generations, right through to the Meshiach ben Yosef, who would be Jesus. And Jesus, in the Gospel of John, predicts that this Comforter is coming. And later, I think because people uh, manipulated text and interpolated their own will, related to Constantine and just before, he called the comforter that was coming right after him to ensure that what he had to say was would be upheld and continued, the Holy Spirit. Let's get back to Ignatius Loyola and what God was supposed to have said to him about the true nature of the Holy Spirit, which would be that it was a man and not a ghost, as in Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, or Holy Spirit. So, Manny comes along after Jesus. He declares himself to be the Comforter. But he's not the only one. Prophet Muhammad is called the Comforter. When you go to chapter 61, verse 6, you have the name of the Comforter given, and the citing of the references in the book of John to Jesus predicting the coming of that comforter. Ahmed in the in the Quranic treatment of the same subject. So we have this continuum from Rachel to Jesus to Manny to Muhammad to the Cathars who several centuries later at Mount Montsegur in in southern France, not that far from Rennes la Chateau, are under siege because they are practicing what, what in Rome and what the Catholic monarchs of Europe considered to be a very deviant form of uh, Gnostic Christianity. So they're fleeing, and they're fleeing with something in a container, and that's a well-known uh, incident. I'm saying that they fled with the teraphim, the comforter stones, or one of them at least. What is so explosive about this code is not only that it infers or implies or in a sense almost directs the seeker to where this artifact may be hidden, but it also brings up the whole issue of who was Jesus really if he's the suffering and apocalyptic Messiah we understand him to be and as he's been identified by, by, by Christianity that means he had to have come through through Rachel. But if you look at the genealogies in the Synoptic Gospels, they don't even, uh, they're not synoptic, the two genealogies in, the, in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They, they are in, in contradiction with each other. But they both state that Jesus descends from Judah, Leah's son, with a number of individuals then descending and then uh, Jesse, David, Solomon, and then on down to Jesus. And this can't be the case because Jesus had to have come from Rachel to be the apocalyptic and suffering Messiah, the Meshiach ben, ben Yosef, as is understood throughout Jewish literature and as was anticipated at the time that Jesus emerged. What we can conclude is that George Anson was in touch with those traditions of Rosicrucianism, Freemasonry, the Kabbalah, uh, and all other sources that, that spoke to the issue of two separate messiahs that identified Rachel as the matriarch of the Meshiach ben Yosef. The issue of the grail being associated with this depiction is extremely important for this reason. The original pronunciation of Rachel in all the Semitic languages sounds almost identical to Grail. Rahil. Rahil. This word means female sheep or you or interestingly mother of the lamb. It also means bright and shiny. It also means warm 
And it also means, Ra'ahel, to see God. The, the fact that the grail uh, is generally considered a chalice, and the sacred chalice that had the holy blood of Jesus, uh, itself is filled with other possibilities in interpretation. Her name means grail, and sounds like grail. He dealt with two grail cups, two grail chalices, the first inc incident uh, in Genesis was when he uh, interpreted a dream of the chalice deliverer to the Pharaoh while he was in prison in Egypt. The second incident was when he hid the grail chalice in his little brother's wheat sack or saddlebag. And the saddlebag in Semitic languages is called Rahil, oddly enough. That goes back to the saddlebag that Rachel hid these teraphim in. These stones symbolize the, the right of heredity, the right of leadership, uh, the right of ownership, of, uh, the right of cultural supremacy, if you will, of a, of a particular family. Rachel sitting on the Horeil, or the Horeil, she was able to keep her father Laban from taking these teraphim. Well, why is that? As he approached the camp of Rachel and her husband, Israel, also known as Jacob, she took her saddlebag and sat on it. When her father came close to her, she said, I'm sorry, Father, I can't get off this camel to greet you because I'm menstruating. It was taboo to touch a woman who was in her monthly cycle in biblical times, um, as it is in is Islam today and amongst many, many uh, conservative and fundamentalist Jews. Well, if that's not holy blood, holy grail, I don't know what is in the most vivid way of imagining it. There was continuity that descended through time to Nicholas Poussin. Anson carried on the reverse relief uh, tradition that Nicholas Poussin had, uh, had, a, had continued from Leonardo da Vinci. Anson continues it with the cipher below uh, as a statement that yes, there is an order that is passing along very, very explosively um, impactful wisdom, knowledge, information, and data that would be quite threatening to, the, to, the, to not only the Roman church, but to Christianity in general, and also to Judaism and Islam as well. The three religions of Abraham are fighting amongst each other today, shouldn't be. They're monotheist. They should be uh, in unity. In, in, a, in a single expression of, of, of worship and belief, if they believe that God is one and indivisible. Because secret societies tended to adhere more to the idea that there was indivisible unity than did Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. That secret had to be protected, maintained, and passed along, and people had to be protected and defended who, who passed that information along. And as a result, we get this complexity of codes and ciphers. In Parsifal, Wolfram von Eschenbach refers to the grail first, not as a chalice, but as a stone, and an inscribed stone. Lapis exilis, then he says the stone they call the grail. And he's not the only one. It's repeated through all the literature that the grail is not a chalice in its first understanding, it's a stone, an inscribed stone. And that's what I believe is here. And what Anson intercepted from Le Jonquier when Le Jonquier was delivering it back to Paris. And the historical record on this is just too, too precise and, and too legitimate to, I think, question at least the veracity of those who made the initial recordings about this. I would rate this decipherment as, as amongst the, the most important, if not the most important, 
in the sense that it does explain every last little part of the monument is um, and its context. Nothing that I've seen falls apart, it just wants more explanation and, and that's why I think it's a, such a solid foundation to go by. I am uh, Thomas Anson Esquire, Member of Parliament for Lichfield, at the present. This is 1805. I have heard a rumour that perhaps in the next year or two I might become a Viscount. My great uncle was tremendously interested in the classical world, and so the, the ceiling is of a classical legend of Apollo and the Morning Star. In the corner, there are various Greek and Egyptian depictions. We have a depiction of Isis on one side, and we have Serapis on the other. These pictures were brought back by uh, my great uncle Thomas when he did the tour of Europe and finished up in Italy. In this portrait of ruins of ancient Rome, we see an enigmatic pyramid. One of the popes wanted and insisted that he be buried under a pyramid. And there it is. Look familiar? You wonder, and then you ask, and then you find out. He, he knew where all these ruins were. Um, and they were simply souvenirs he brought back. This is where the Da Vinci Code's on trial, right? This is the round church of Temple Church. It is in the round church section of Temple Church where we find the sarcophagi of the Knights Templar on the floor with their heads resting on pillow stones. This was built exclusively for their use and there's no uh, dispute or question about its initial purpose. We're sitting uh, right across the street from the courthouse where the trial is ongoing. Uh, concerning the accusations uh, leveled by uh, Béjant and Lee, the authors of the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, on trial is the publishing company of the Da Vinci Code. The charges that uh, Dan Brown lifted the architecture from the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, authored by Béjant and Lee, as well as Lincoln, and used it to write the Da Vinci Code with. But there's no doubt about the use of the uh, cornerstone motif that Dan Brown employs in uh, Église saint Sulpice in Paris and the story uh, of the stone tablet that was retrieved by La Verandry, given that La Verandry had sent it to uh, the Count of Maurepas who built the sacristy in Église saint Sulpice and who is paid homage to by King Louis XV on the famous gnomon that Dan Brown uses. And not to forget, Dan Brown buries uh, that stone in the floor of Igli Saints of Peace. So all this combined tells me that there is something very peculiar about this stone tablet and having custodial duty over it or having it in one's possession. The symbolic value of it, if it's what I believe it is, I suppose could be enough to warrant and merit <laughs> murder, threats of murder, and all these vicious court cases that are still going on. This is the uh, Wisdom Library, which represents, as many people know here and abroad, the wisdom collection of Manly Palmer Hall who from his very youth was, was passionate about bringing together the, the wisdom literature of the different cultures of the world. He wanted to, to transcend the belief systems 
that often divide and tear people apart, whereas wisdom literature brings us together through its universal language. And that's why we welcome uh, Buff Perry's work, is that we can take a look at some very deep and profound implications of what it really means to go back and see what, what are those issues, those ideals, those principles that, that represent the quest for the, for the, greater, the greater life. So Obadiah, you're, you're the director of the Philosophical Research uh, Society yeah. and the university. Yes, well, and it's interesting how, how they work together so well, and that was also part of the vision of the founder. But the, the reason I asked the question about his demise um, is that there, there seems to be a pattern of interest on the part of a particular group of people uh, associated with a particular artifact that goes by many different names. We have, for example, the one that was supposed to have been kept in here, um, yes. not in this statue. This is just a, a, this this is a, a symbol of the foundation stone of, of, of America. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And and it, Rorick called it the Chintamani. He right. called it the the uh, the uh, Lapis Exilis, which right. is a, a reworking, some say, anagram of the Elixir Stone, the Philosopher's Stone, Philosopher stone. and and Manley Hall had some interest to, in the symbolic meaning oh. and history of that, oh, and, uh, and this demise of his had something to do, some people believe, with, with his uh, interest in this well, Lapis Exilis or... I, I don't know, because I'm, I'm two years too late to know, but I've heard all the stories. Uh, I, I think that whatever was the means of his passing. We do know he was in his RV at the time with uh, a, a couple of people who's, who were under suspicion. But the, the truth is that uh, he left a huge heritage in a collection of, of, of books that represents one of the finest collections of wisdom literature, certainly in North America. But all that said, this this artifact that we're dealing with was found in North America, 1743, and delivered to the Jesuits of New France, of Quebec. Mm -hmm. And they identified a script on it. Long story short, it was intercepted and it was brought to England by, by Admiral George Anson on its way to Paris from New France. He uses all of his wealth from his, you know, if you will, uh, uh, pirating around the world, uh, you know, uh, uh, capturing all these ships on behalf of the British uh, Empire as it was just dawning. And with his wealth and with his brother, uh, Thomas Anson, this fantastic uh, display of monuments at Litchfield Estate. So in this one particular monument, we have this enigmatic, or what was until I broke the code, an enigmatic code. Mm -hmm. And this is it uh, enlarged. Yeah. as you see it at the base in this mm -hmm. photograph. At that time, I'd only released uh, part of this decipherment, mm -hmm. and I hadn't released all the middle letters, just the two on the outside of the base, the D and the M, mm -hmm. which stand for 1500, 1500th verse of Genesis. What I didn't release then, and have subsequently released, and what's gotten all the fanfare, is the meaning of the middle letters, not the D and the N being 1500, but mm -hmm. what, the, what I know that you have such a keen interest in, which is this, this, this use of Hebrew um, in, a, in a, an arcane context by a lot of secret societies and, and others, mm -hmm. uh, because most other people don't know what it, what it means, and it's a way to keep secrets, and it's also a way to transmit important knowledge right. that, that might otherwise be tainted. If, if transmitted incorrectly. To those who can understand it. The O, uh, when it's associated with the H as an article, ha or ho, in Hebrew grammar. So if I was to say the Messiah, I would say mm -hmm. ha Mashiach. Mm -hmm. um, but when Hebrew became Hellenized, mm -hmm. it drifted a little bit phonologically toward the Greek sound pattern. Mm -hmm. So as a result, what we have is what I'm going to show you here. This is, these are all the ways that you represent the right. article, mm -hmm. the, in Hebrew. The right. little dot right. on the side makes it the, the O sound. That gives it an A sound, A sound, a, a sound, he, ha, ha, ho. Right. 
So these are the four ways that the word the is represented in Hebrew uh, writing and grammar and you know spoken he Hebrew. When you have Hebrew drifting into Indo-European languages, often the H is dropped. It's dropped, for example, in the word Armageddon, right. which before it was called Armageddon is Har Megiddo, uh -huh. that then is Ar Megiddo and becomes Armageddon. Right. So there's several such examples. And given that this is translated or transliterated mm -hmm. script wise from, from Hebrew to Roman, the H will be dropped mm -hmm. because once it's into the Roman, Greco Roman scheme of things, it's not going to be ha or ho, especially the Roman, mm -hmm. it's going to be more like o. Yeah. And hence, we, that's the, that would be the first word, the. Okay? Mm -hmm. Second word is, is avav, avav. But mm -hmm. because it's Hebrew, you have to turn it around given that it's avav. The avav is written avav, okay? And yeah. it all has to do with the blossom. Sound that out. Just do the U-O-S-V. Just sound it out as it appears to you. I'm not sure, U-O-S-V. Well. I'll give you a hint. Uh -huh. um, Joseph is of course not pronounced Joseph. No, it's in not. Hebrew. Yeah, it's Yosef. So what you have here, this this is uh, Yosef. Yes, exactly as any Hebrew-speaking person would pronounce it. Mm -hmm. So Yosef, the blossom. So it's the bloom or blossom of Yosef. Of Yosef, but in this one precious verse, he's called the 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 bloom. And then he's, right, just a few words later, he's called the stone and the shepherd of Israel. So the stone that, it, that he's being called, I would say is a direct reference to the pillow stone of his father, Jacob. Mm -hmm. So the tradition in Judaism of the son of Joseph, Meshach ben Yosef, mm -hmm being a Messiah, an expected Messiah, that would be associated only with Rachel, not with Leah, who, you know, who gives birth to Judah. That's true. There's an interesting postscript epilogue to this documentary project that arose just recently. I was asked by Dr. Obadiah Harris, the president of the University of Philosophical Research and Philosophical Research Society, to provide him with some original information about the Illuminati because he's going to soon be giving a presentation on the subject. The Illuminati were also called by another name, which is uh, perfectibilists. If you were to say this word in French in a comprehensive way, you would say parfait, the perfected ones. It turns out that the Cathars were led by preachers and teachers who were called the parfait. There were four parfaits who are said to have taken a small chest or casket containing some kind of religious or physical treasure in the dark of night out of uh, Monsagor down the cliffs onto no one knows where for sure. People have speculated about what it was that these parfaits had taken with them but if there is a continuous series of links between the Cathars, the Knights Templar, the latter Knights Templar, and the earliest formation of the Illuminati, it may well be that what was carried out by those four parfaits from Monsegur has everything to do with the secret that the Illuminati were said to have possessed. This could have a lot to do with the very original formation of the Jesuits themselves, given the fact that the person who brought about the Illuminati to begin with, this Adam uh, Weishaupt, uh, had been appointed by a Jesuit into the post of being director or the head of, or professor of canon law at Ingolstadt. 
and that he actually is said to have practiced the Jesuit rituals and ceremonial events. All this goes to the likelihood that the Illuminati were in possession of something that empowered them with knowledge that others didn't have. And I would argue that if, in fact, the original Illuminati were Jesuits, that had to do, that secret had to do with the founder of the Jesuits themselves, Ignatius Loyola, who was canonized, beatified, because he was supposed to have been in communication with God about the secret identity of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. So what would that big secret be? It has something to do with the identity of the Comforter. And that brings us then back to the Cathars and their link to the Templars. Is it possible or is it almost certain that that some articles were passed along through this uh, you know, millennium of transmission? that engages Rachel, that engages Manny, that literally engages the Prophet Muhammad because he was identified as the Comforter and in the Quran there's a reference to to the Comforter uh, in chapter 61 verse 6 um, and we can carry it straight through to the expansion of the Manichaean religion and all of the names that it became. You know, did, is there an ongoing transmission of articles of faith that ended up in the hands of Knights Templar and or uh, the Jesuits, given the, 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 the Jesuits and their association with, with the Illuminati. That's it.